Intelligent Transportation Systems Podcast. Hello everyone, welcome back to the ITS Podcast. The best podcast you can follow to keep track on the cutting edge of intelligent transportation science and engineering. I'm Javier Sanchez Medina from the IEEE Intelligent Transportation Systems Society. Welcome, come in, have a seat. We have prepared a super interesting brand new episode. Are you one of the kind scared to death with a mere idea of being transported in a self-driven car? Would you pay to enjoy a ride at Google's or any other autonomous vehicle prototype? Would you pay to avoid it? Today we will talk about that. In this episode center ring we have Dr. Cristina Laverri Monreal conducting a fantastic interview about how will it be like being a passenger in an autonomous vehicle. Her interviewee, Mohamed El Banhawi, PhD candidate at RMIT University Down Under and leading author of a recent ITS magazine paper titled In the Passenger Seat, Investigating Ride Comfort Measures in Autonomous Cars. Additionally, Mehran and Shirazi have developed again, as brilliantly as usual, a very interesting transportation history mini section, this time about how warfare have had a clear impact on the development of many transportation systems. Don't miss it. But that's not all of it. We also have a super interesting news mini section by Dr. Marianne Kaveshgar on autonomous trucks and the revolution in goods transport they can bring along. And all of this just for our very special listeners, our unique community of transportation fans we care about so much. Let's start, we hope to enjoy. This is the news mini section for episode 26, June 2015 by Mariam Kaveshkar. Whenever the topic of autonomous vehicles comes up, people imagine the self-driving Google car. However, the concept of autonomous car is much more diverse. One of the fields that autonomous driving system is considered is in trucks. Companies like Scania, Volvo or Daimler each have their own version of an autonomous truck. Volvo demonstrated its autonomous truck and convoy on the roads of Spain called Project Sartre. Scania's system is called EcoRoll and it uses both GPS and topographic maps to calculate whether cruising in neutral downhill or using engine braking with a fuel supply switched off is best for the vehicle's kinetic energy. The state of Nevada in the U.S. has given license to Daimler Truck North America or DTNA to test its first self-driving semi and also Daimler debuted its Freightliner Inspiration truck during a press conference early this month. This truck is based on the series-produced US Freightliner Cascadia model, but with the addition of the highway pilot technology which makes it usable on American highways. As soon as the Freightliner Inspiration truck is safely on the highway, the driver can activate the highway pilot system the highway pilot system uses a complex stereo camera and radar systems with lane keeping and collision prevention functions. It regulates the speed, applies the brakes and steers. The highway pilot system does not initiate autonomous passing maneuvers or leaving the highway or changing lanes. The driver can deactivate the highway pilot manually. The adaptive cruise control system of the Freightliner Inspiration truck uses the same hardware and software as the series production variants. The active power steering system uses the same hardware, but the software has been modified. According to Daimler, truck transported about 70% of all freight in the US in 2012 and by 2050 the global trucking industry is expected to triple. Autonomous trucks can have the same boosting effect on economy that once railways had. This might be a reason for governments to support the research and ease the rules. Transportation in History by Mehran Shirazi, PhD candidate at Simon Fraser University, Canada. Everyone knows about negative aspects of wars. However, they have had a few benefits too. New products and technologies have been developed and adopted for civilian use when they were no longer needed for military applications. Although the price has been terribly high, 
huge innovations in transportation systems have been made and employed beyond their original military intents. We mention a few of them here. 1. GPS The navigation system that you use in your car that tells you where to go to find your address is a result of the Cold War. US developed this system to destroy Soviet Union. 2. Autonomous cars It seems that driverless cars will be an important part of future transportation. Much of the development of these systems is because of the research and driverless car challenges supported by Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. 3. Synthetic Oil Synthetic oils and fuels were developed by the US and Germany in the beginning of World War II. They were originally designed to improve the performance of military aircrafts in the war. 4. Laminated Glass The first major application of laminated glass, invented by Eduard Benedictus, was in gas masks in World War I. Later, it became one of the most important safety features of cars all over the world. 5. Highways Romans used to make roads to facilitate enlarging their empire. The modern highways were first developed in World War II to link military bases together. 6. Radar Radars have been widely used in almost all forms of transportation. Most of the progress of the development of radar was during World War II for military applications. 7. Jet Engine Jet engine was developed by military and for military purposes at an incredibly rapid pace during World War II by many different countries. It was used in civilian aircraft in 1949, only four years after the end of the war. They doubled the speed of airplanes and therefore, for the passengers, made the world half as large as it was before. Can you imagine transportation without these inventions? Are you ready for our main content of today's episode? Dr. Cristina Laverre Monreal volunteered as interviewer for this one. She's senior scientist and research group leader with the Austrian Institute of Technology in Vienna. Well, here we go, and you're all right. Today we are with Mohamed Ganawe from the School of Aerospace, Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering at the RMIT University in Melbourne in Australia. Mohamed received a bachelor's degree in Advanced Manufacturing and Mechatronics from the RMIT University in 2012, and he is currently pursuing a PhD degree from the same university. His research topics are randomized motion planning for autonomous cars, as well as motion planning, autonomous robots research, and contemporary issues of autonomous robots. His work is supported by the Australian Postgraduate Award and Research Training Scheme Scholarships. Mohamed is as well a member of the Autonomous Systems Research Group at the RMIT University. He is the leading author of a recent ITS magazine paper called In the Passenger Seat, Investigating Right Comfort Measures in Autonomous Cars. It appears to be an obvious query, but the implications of autonomous transportation upon society as a whole have not been explored. As individuals who rely heavily on traditional manual vehicles, it is difficult to say how deeply change our needs will become through this change. Could you please explain, Mohamed, what this paper is about? Uh, first, uh, let me thank you for this introduction. I'm very happy to be on the program today and to present uh, our research. As we know, cars are by far the most popular mode of transportation when we look at the distance traveled by them or the time spent in them. The problem with current transportation systems are traffic uh, efficiency, energy consumption, pollution, and safety. According to recent estimates, there is about 1.2 million fatalities annually around the world. These accidents are mostly related to driver error, infrastructure, and the vehicle itself. The majority of these uh, accidents 
can we then trace the actual human errors? We know that accidents decrease with better infrastructure and driver training. As you mentioned, there is a wide-scale commercial uh, deployment of autonomous cars that is expected in the next few years. Uh, this is owing to having more computational power and robust uh, sensing uh, platforms. The major automotive manufacturers have programs dedicated to developing such cars, and this promises a reduction in highway fatalities and improvement in traffic and fuel efficiencies. However, uh, our understanding of the effects arising from commuting in autonomous cars is still very limited. So this paper, first of all, compares traditional passenger comfort measures to um, expected uh, autonomous car uh, comfort measures. We then proceed to review recent uh, research in autonomous cars, human factors, and intelligent cars. In general, the focus uh, of, these, of this paper narrows down to motion planning for autonomous cars as well, and the objective uh, was to review and highlight the gaps in current motion planning techniques compared to um, what we need for uh, passenger comfort uh, from that perspective. And the expectation is to generate interest in that field and start bringing some innovations to the field of path, uh, path planning for passenger vehicles. Okay, this is really very interesting. In your paper, you introduce as well the concept of loss of driver controllability, and you mentioned that a reassessment of vehicle's comfort criteria is needed. That's really, really interesting. Could you please explain it to the listeners? So traditionally, uh, research has shown that passengers are more uh, prone to motion sickness than drivers, simply because we know that drivers are relying on visual cues and references outside the vehicle to sort of navigate and follow, follow the road's curvature, while passengers are not necessarily focused on the driving scene, so they may be experiencing some steering-induced disturbances uh, in sort of, and experiencing some lateral acceleration. They may still be able to predict the vehicle's motion. However, uh, maneuvers such as lane change may not be uh, expected by the passengers. When autonomous vehicles uh, are introduced, the role of occupants will change uh, from drivers to passengers, and we will not have any control on the vehicle's behavior or direction of motion. So that, that's what we refer to as the loss of controllability. Recent surveys in the U.S., China, India, Japan, U.K., and Australia show that about 50% of autonomous vehicle occupants uh, that have been surveyed expect not to pay attention to the road, not to watch the road. They expect to do some other tasks, such as reading and texting. All these factors will also contribute to increasing the likelihood of autonomous passenger discomfort and motion sickness. We will be more uh, likely to experience motion sickness because there is a conflict in our inertial and visual systems, and we have no control over the motion uh, of the vehicle. According to a recent uh, report by the University of Michigan, they expect uh, one in eight uh, autonomous vehicle passengers to exhibit some sort of motion sickness in autonomous cars. It is a different problem from traditional cars where the drivers are in control, it is still essential to have comfortable seats, comfortable suspension to maintain the right comfort, but we will uh, now have to investigate uh, different seating arrangement, positioning, cabin layouts, console layouts, uh, investigate the effects of external visibility or the lack of, and other safety um, factors may have to be investigated as well. At the end, we need to have large-scale passenger experiments to evaluate all these different research uh, questions. Yeah, I think your paper really deals with a very important problem that is also very timely and that will affect a lot of car makers. So they will have to convince the passengers to rely on these new technologies. Do you think you can provide passengers a sense of safety strong enough to trust these new ways of transport? Uh, this is a really good question. We can all agree that the technology is here. It will be ready for mass production and consumption very soon. Certainly countries like the U.S. and Germany have led the way by allowing uh, passenger uh, sort of autonomous car testing on the roads and highways amongst other vehicles. They have issued some sort of uh, special licensing for cars. However, uh, I don't think the acceptance of autonomous cars is limited by the trust or the insecurity from passengers. 
in our paper, we mentioned sort of um, different inhibiting factors. First of all, the personal factor is important. So from a cost-benefit perspective, purchasing uh, an autonomous car might seem like a, a very logical decision. It will save you fuel time, reduce the risk of uh, being involved in an accident. But it's, it's not that simple for people. Humans have sort of very sentimental feeling about their cars and about their decisions. That's why we have advertising companies and marketing agencies. Cars are products that um, are a big investment for most people, but they are also very sentimental and sort of iconic um, purchases for people. So it's, it's not a simple cost-benefit sort of uh, transactions. Um, there has also been some coverage in the media regarding uh, that so, sort of uh, self-driving vehicles or autonomous cars will ruin the thrill of driving, and some of that, of some of those associated feelings for some of these drivers. On the other hand, recent surveys show that 60% of people had uh, positive attitudes towards buying or using an autonomous car. Another uh, survey that was conducted in the U.S., the U.K., and Australia concluded that most people have. Uh, positive attitudes towards owning an, um, an autonomous car. However, they are not pilling, uh, willing to pay more for that technology. So even though the technology is there, it will take uh, a bit of time to expand uh, to the public. And also, they are concerned with the safety of autonomous cars, as you mentioned. This brings us to a second uh, sort of inhibiting factor that we mentioned in the paper, which is safety. Obviously, there's been a lot of... Um, research on active safety and driver, uh, driver assistance systems in intelligent vehicles. In all these cases, it is still a driver sort of centric uh, system. The driver shares the control with the vehicle, but they're still responsible for the, the main behavior of the car. This is not the case for uh, autonomous cars. There is no shared responsibility with the occupants. It is the vehicle that's making all the decision making. So whilst the ve vehicle uh, may not be behaving might be behaving safely and maintaining proper gaps, this may not be apparent to the occupant. For example, we have very limited visibility as opposed to a laser scanner or a LiDAR that's sitting on top of the, of the vehicle, which has a 50 or 60 meter range. So while the vehicle is behaving in a safe manner, it's not apparent uh, for us. Also, driving is a very sort of subtle behavior. For humans, we've developed some subtle gestures and maneuvers, such as slowing down to allow someone to change the lanes. This may not be apparent to autonomous vehicles at the start, uh, and it can have a sense of hostility or endangerment towards uh, other human drivers that are sharing the road within autonomous cars. In robotics, there is a large body of work uh, on social navigation of mobile robots with humans in crowded rooms and university campuses. Uh, there is uh, a large body of work on perceived safety when interacting with robotic arms in sort of uh, collaborative manufacturing uh, situations, but not for autonomous cars. Um, we, st we still don't have a lot of research uh, on the occupant's uh, perspective and also on the drivers or that are sharing the road uh, with uh, autonomous cars. So that's uh, certainly an aspect to be um, explored. Uh, we will gain more understanding by having more more people and more companies putting uh, those uh, autonomous cars on the on the road, and we will get more data from that. The other aspect of uh, safety is the our own personal um, data. Uh, we have to sort of have um, privacy of that information. Another aspect is cybersecurity. Um, some researchers have shown that our current cars are vulnerable to spoofing and hacking. To me, this is more important uh, than the actual driving uh, behavior of the car. There are a lot of examples of uh, spoofing and sending false signals to un unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, which have received false GPS or map uh, data to the robot itself. Because occupants don't have a way of resuming control of the vehicle, where we must ensure that the vehicle is robust to such um, spoofing techniques. 
Okay, yes, you said a lot of things related to safety, and the next question is actually related to safety, because it uh, deals insurance companies and liability, what is a very important element in the event of unexpected. As they say, accidents will happen. So what are your thoughts on a remedy to this solution? Who will shoulder the blame? Uh, it is true, accidents uh, will happen. Traditionally, the driver would be liable for their own vehicle. They need to prove that they weren't negligent in their driving. For autonomous cars, uh, there's certainly two sides to this argument. From a passenger perspective, if an accident happens, that should they should not be liable because they aren't physically operating the vehicle. As far as the passenger is concerned, it appears that the car manufacturer that wrote the software for the vehicle's behavior is responsible for that accident if it occurs. However, it is the passenger that is choosing to utilize this vehicle, which is a source of hazard on the, on the road in autonomous mode, and they have chose not to drive the vehicle. So unless the accident was a defect by the manufacturer, they, they would be liable. So unless the product is defective, the owner would be liable in this case, but there's certainly a lot of debate in this uh, area. On the other hand, making manufacturers uh, liable for accidents can be actually a huge barrier for entering the market, which can ultimately have negative effects on innovation in, in this field. Um, l the legal integration of autonomous cars within existing sort of legal framework will be challenging, as it says now, we know that our laws are not structured to deal with this sort of problem uh, of a piece of software or robotic platform that is controlling a vehicle that is interacting and affecting other human beings. The innovation by scientists and engineers in this field will have to be matched by government and legal bodies to address such uh, uh, challenging issues. We also need to consider not only the liability and insurance uh, perspective, but the licensing and the training and risk uh, management of autonomous behavior. I think that uh, traditional car owners and autonomous car owners will have to be retrained to deal with uh, these vehicles on the road. Another question that comes to mind is what happens when the car is not occupied? Does the car have to be occupied all the time? Will you be able to call your car from a, a different parking spot or a different location? So that's sort of another question. I think at the moment it is difficult to predict the regulation um, that is needed for self-driving cars. It, is, it parallels cent a century ago when cars were originally uh, introduced. We needed a lot of trial and error to reach the state which we are today. And the law keeps changing even uh, today, but it's certainly time to ask these questions. It is also important to remember that cars are different from traditional uh, autonomous cars are different from sort of driver centric systems such as cruise control and lane keeping systems autonomous cars are, are vehicle centric systems um, they will be safer uh, than human cars uh, but we need to build a safety case for them by putting them on the road and gaining more hours and more uh, reliability on the road uh, but it's definitely something uh, that's interesting to, to study at the moment, especially recovering from unforeseen failures or unsort of studied scenarios of driving. Yes, it is true. There are still some open questions related to autonomous driving. Okay, another very interesting topic that you mentioned in your paper is the one of the ownership. In a previous episode of the ITS podcast, we talked to Jeff Allen from the Drive Oregon about the shift of our feelings regarding the importance of owning a car if we can use a car sharing system in a convenient way. What are your thoughts on this matter? Uh, well, we know in first world countries, certainly there are too many cars. There's almost 55 cars per 100 people. Depending on where you look, these cars are used uh, anywhere between 30 and 90 minutes a day. For example, in my case, it's 40 minutes a day. So it's clearly not a great uh, investment. It is very easy to see the benefits of an autonomous car sharing system. It reduces the amount of traffic on the road. It improves the effective, uh, the efficiency, sorry, of our infrastructure. Uh, and it increases the, throup uh, the throughput of that infrastructure. Um, in essence, because 
we're enhancing the maneuverability and the responses uh, of the car as opposed to human drivers. Sorry, uh, some estimates predict that there is going to be about 50% improvements in infrastructure just by using autonomous cars. Carpooling, for example, is expected to reduce uh, greenhouse emissions and energy consumption by 75% in some studies. It's very optimistic, but even a fraction of that 75% improvement would be uh, a great achievement. On the other hand, it brings us back to my uh, original point that people are still attached uh, to their cars and they cars are very sentimental objects as opposed to uh, a lot of other uh, products that we buy. It turns out that people are actually quite open to sharing services. We can see that by... Um, by some examples, now you can order uh, a car using your smartphone nowadays. There's a lot of services that are opening that. They have been uh, quite successful in major cities, and they've been uh, widely accepted by customers. But on the other hand, they still fall back to that sort of um, gray area when it comes to insurance and the legality of these um, sort of uh, car sharing systems. They also face some resistance from existing taxi services and unions and drivers and all of that uh, body as well. It is difficult to imagine. Uh, it is not difficult to imagine from from a few years from now that you can order an autonomous car from your uh, smart mobile phone from a fleet of existing mobile cars or autonomous cars uh, where you only have to pay some sort of membership or subscription instead of owning uh, an autonomous vehicle. This will simplify also the liability, since neither the manufacturer or the occupant are uh, liable for uh, the vehicle's uh, behavior, but the sort of the car sh uh, sharing system or provider. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are going to have a little break now, and we will talk later after a few minutes. Hello again. Do you know that the IEEE Italian Transportation Systems Society has a Twitter account where you can follow all about the ITS podcast and a lot more? Search for ITSSIEEE. -E -E. We also have a Facebook page. Same instructions. Search for ITSSIEEE. -E -E. Please join us. And here's one final piece of information. If you are an IEEE Italian Transportation Systems Society member, we are collecting nominations for its Board of Governors election that will happen next fall. So, if you have someone in mind, or if you want to self-nominate, please visit this episode's post at itsp.cicei.com and you'll get more information. itsp.cicei.com Thanks for listening to the ITS podcast. Let's get back to our today's interview. We are already back from our little break, and now we are continuing with the questions. Here goes the next one. When talking about passenger comfort, I believe it includes an extensive amount of psychological understanding of the expectations of passengers. What do they fear or what do they rely on? I think that's very challenging. In feeling comfortable, does knowing every minute the detail of the autonomous vehicle's operation process help, or do you think it is better to remain ignorant of all the fine grain problems the vehicle systems are solving? Well, uh, as we know, there are three main contributors to motion sickness in general. The inability to predict the motion, the inability to control the motion direction, and the conflict between the visual and inertial systems uh, in the passenger. The fact that passengers will not be paying attention to the road, but focusing, as we said earlier, on reading or texting, for example, will contribute to increasing their risk of motion sickness and overall discomfort. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, relaying some information back to the passengers might be a solution to improving their experience. For instance, uh, researchers have shown that uh, public transport commuters are less likely to experience motion sickness when they focus on the road and the external surroundings Uh, as opposed to the internal of the, of the vehicle itself. There is a large spectrum uh, for the information that can be fed back. The idea is finding that ideal amount of information. It becomes a really interesting sort of research question. 
what level of feedback is enough to give the passenger a sense of the path or the motion without overloading them or preventing them from doing other uh, activities. Based on research in traditional cars and in public transport, I would imagine that just knowing um, the maneuver that's being executed can be quite useful. For instance, of the ve- if the vehicle is stopping or starting or doing a U-turn or taking an exit or changing lanes, that would be quite useful to know. I don't think knowing the minute details such as changing the velocity, detecting uh, another car or a jaywalker, especially uh, these cars, uh, will have uh, quite a large uh, viewing range as opposed to the passenger, which can only see up to the car in front of them. It's important to remember, though, that these all these assumptions are based on research on traditional vehicles and in public transport. So it's definitely a question to be answered by having passengers in uh, experimental vehicles and conducting these uh, sort of trials. So there's a lot of uh, research, a lot of interesting research to be done in that field as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, I also found quite interesting in your paper how you differentiated the factors that affected passengers' comfort in manual vehicles than those that will affect their comfort in autonomous vehicles. So you explain that in the traditional side of one of the included images, uh, air quality, sound and noise, as well as temperature and vibrations, are comfort factors. And then you have on the other side naturality, disturbances, apparent safety and motion sickness when referring to autonomous cars. I think this classification is really very interesting. For example, it is commonplace that many drivers get motion sickness when they have to sit away from the steering wheel. But what are the other three about? Could you please explain them? Uh, So let me start by saying that passenger comfort in traditional vehicles is very well studied. Uh, Research have developed methods to quantify and assess uh, passenger comfort. They generally focus on vibrations and motions resulting from high-frequency road disturbances, which can be uh, attenuated using suspensions and comfortable uh, seat designs. Other factors such as cabin temperature, noise from tires, wind, exhaust, the engine itself have also been quantified, and the air quality inside the cabin. Um, All these factors are still relevant for autonomous cars, but we get another set of factors from the loss of controllability. Uh, I mentioned um, that the focus of this paper was to highlight the side effects of autonomous uh, vehicles on passengers, uh, especially path planning, which dictates the behavior of the vehicle, which again is linked uh, to passenger comfort. We've addressed uh, the first uh, factor before, which is uh, motion motion, uh, sickness in the earlier question above. the second effect is, uh, or the second side effect is res- uh, the resemblance of the motion to an actual human driver. Uh, generally speaking, path planning algorithms generally focus on minimizing the time need- needed to execute the path or the distance of the planned path. For example, uh, however, this is not the case for human uh, drivers. We know that human drivers focus on maintaining a continually changing uh, steering angle, for example, when conducting uh, a lane change. And this this is how roads uh, are designed. Another example is that is it is essential for the vehicle to follow the, the lane, um, not just to follow the shortest path. So while a path uh, may be quite efficient for the vehicle or the planning algorithm, it actually may feel strange for a passenger that is not used to this this way of uh, conducting uh, a lane change. We also know that humans change their speed when negotiating uh, a curve to minimize the error between the road curvature and their and the vehicle's uh, curvature. A very important aspect will be machine learning where, uh, to monitor actual human driving behavior in different scenarios and learn from that and adapt uh, our planning algorithms to suit or to parallel. Uh, human driving. We also mention uh, apparent safety in our mo- uh, in our paper, and we've discussed that uh, slightly above. It is important to feel uh, or to convey safe operations to to the passenger, even though the vehicle is behaving in a safe manner. And considering all the dy- dynamic uh, environment around it, and all the traffic laws, and the vehicle stability, and static obstacles uh, around the vehicle, this may not be 100% clear uh, to the passenger. 
Uh, we expect uh, that this can be achieved uh, by considering other factors such as the distance from another vehicles. We know that autonomous cars don't need to keep uh, a large gap because they have uh, very small reaction times as opposed to human operators. But that distance has been shown to be a factor uh, for human comfort. We know that from research on wheel, uh, wheelchair occupants, for example, their comfort levels were, impro- were improved by explicitly considering the distance from other obstacles and uh, the visibility uh, of, the, of the path that's being chosen. Still, we don't have an, an ideal gap or an ideal reaction time for a passenger to feel safe in an autonomous car. We know that a car with a laser scanner can see up to 150 uh, or uh, uh, sorry, up to 50 meters under different conditions, and it's programmed to react in an optimal manner. However, that optimal manner will not be clear to the passenger. Finally, it is essential to minimize the disturbances acting on the passenger. As I mentioned earlier, the main focus in traditional vehicles is to mani- uh, minimize uh, the high-frequency road disturbances that occur from bumps and the rough surface of the road itself. And we design suspension systems and active suspension systems to mitigate that. Another category for disturbances is the load disturbances, which result from the vehicle's uh, behavior and the vehicle's steering and handling. Researchers have found a strong correlation between passengers' comfort and the, ve- and the driver's uh, behavior. In autonomous car, the driver's behavior is uh, controlled by the path planning uh, algorithm that's running on that vehicle. Steering disturbances in, in autonomous cars uh, will be a, a major factor in um, the passenger uh, comfort. And we should, uh, and the, the focus on planning algorithms should be minimizing these uh, disturbances to convey a sense of safety and comfort uh, to the passenger. Mm-hmm. Okay. Another refreshing aspect in your paper is the inclusion of ergonomics. One may not readily think the passenger seat could or should be different if you are not moving your arms and legs to control the vehicle anymore. Perhaps they could be more fashion in the style of a sitting room sofa, right? What do you think about this? Well, ideally, we would be redesigning these vehicles from the ground up, um, not just retrofitting sensors and actuators on on existing vehicles. I don't think it's very feasible at this moment because we're not making enough uh, of autonomous cars. In the foreseeable future, uh, there is there will be still an expectation of shared control between the passenger and the vehicle. Uh, but it is suboptimal to just attach sensors uh, and actuators to uh, current vehicles. It would be very interesting to see how manufacturers uh, redesign the vehicles and what sort of designs they uh, come up with. Internally, as well, we would have to look at redesigning the vehicle. The fact that no one needs to be watching the road opens up a lot of possibilities. Uh, we may look into positioning seats even more forward. Uh, Because there's no need for pedals and steering wheels, this will improve the passenger's uh, visibility and reduce the effect of steering disturbances. We don't have a dashboard, so we can look at increasing uh, the occupant's uh, visibility, which will also improve their uh, experience in the vehicle. We can also look at changing the layout of the seats to increase the productivity of the passengers, because we know that they will be reading and possibly doing uh, or working during their commute. So it's it's definitely uh, essential to redesign the internal layout of the vehicle. Mm-hmm. And now for finalizing this interview, uh, I'm going to ask you the last question. What is related to the motion sickness or how it can be relieved, especially providing the driver with feedback on his surroundings? This is what you are mentioning in your paper. Could you please elaborate a little bit on this? Have experiments been performed to test motion sickness under real field test conditions, for example? Uh, as we know, uh, in autonomous cars, the passengers cannot control or predict uh, the motion. They're not focused uh, on the road. So feedback is definitely essential to ensure that they are aware of the vehicle's behavioral behavior and to convey a sense of safety to the passenger. Uh, we have some examples in our paper, such as uh, audible feedback. So just mentioning what 
the path, uh, the path or the maneuver uh, is going to be. Another option is uh, augmented reality, where we can overlay uh, the actual maneuver or the expected uh, path uh, on the dashboard itself. Another interesting uh, solution could be something like haptic feedback, which simply nudges the passenger in the direction of the turning. Again, it may be enough to just display uh, some information on the, ba- the dashboard. So that's still uh, an open question. We still have some, a lot of other open questions, such as how often should we um, update the, the passenger? What type of feedback is more effective? Um, is feedback effective for some maneuvers but not others? And obviously the detail of, the, of that feedback is still an open question. Uh, we are planning to conduct some field experiments with passengers towards the end of this year. Uh, we, we need to obviously gain some more understanding through, through these experiments. We started, we have built uh, our own experimental vehicle and we're preparing for human testing uh, as we speak. Uh, the next stage for us is definitely getting uh, some government funding or some industry funding to use uh, um, an actual vehicle that can be retrofitted with our, uh, our control architecture and to continue on with these uh, field experiments. Very well. Okay, so now we arrive to the end of this interview. And we wanted to thank you very much for the nice answers you gave us and for providing us with so much information about this interesting research topic. Uh, Thanks. Thank you for having me today. Well, well, this one is gone. We really hope you like it. Please feedback us with your comments. Do you have any suggestions for the show? Any interviewee or topic you want us to include? What are you waiting for? Let us know. Thank you. This podcast is sponsored by the IEEE Intelligent Transportation System Society, a website designed and managed by the Innovation Center for the Information Society at the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria in Spain. Soundtrack developed by Rui Kong, language advisory by Manuel Arbelo and Professor Son Williams from Clemson University in South Carolina. We'll be back soon bringing you again the cutting edge of science at the Intelligent Transportation Systems Podcast. Thanks for listening and right side.